morning. How are you? I'm glad that you are here. The brave, those who are going to come out and take the risks. Uh, God rewards you for that, and I'm thankful that you're here. Uh, we did our part. We, you know, stepped aside, not having services for a while, but uh, I don't see that ever happening again. So we're we're moving forward. We got an assignment. We have a mission. We're serious about that. We believe it's impacting the world, impacting eternity, and we get to be part of that. Now we're doing a series that we just started last week called The Great Comeback. And the reason we're doing this is who doesn't love a great comeback? I mean, whether it's in athletics or whether it's in some business story, somebody, somebody's personal story, we, we love that. There's something in us that just resonates when you're, in, when you're behind, when you're in a setback, you're in a difficult spot, and, uh, and things just kind of help you to launch you out of that. Now, God is all about helping us get from setbacks into great comebacks. I mean, it's all throughout the Bible. We're going to be looking at a number of the different people. Jesus, of course, is the most uh, representative of somebody who is in a setback in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was being crucified. He got crucified. He, he, he gave up you know, his, his spirit. He was dead. And then three days later, the ultimate great comeback through the resurrection. But we see it time and time again uh, in the Bible. And we're going to be looking at one of those guys uh, today. His name is Job. Job. Now, uh, if, if Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible. Uh, it's, uh, if, you, if you go to the Old Testament, you go into about the middle, you'll find Psalms. And then one book right before that is Job. And one of the interesting things about Job is his name, the way we pronounce it. Because if you look at it, it's, it's J-O-B. I mean, we pronounce that Job. So if you're a new believer, uh, part of your initiation right is to mispronounce that name. And most of us know that. I mean, we all, I think we all did it, right? I mean, you, hey, what's up with this, this book, Job? And then somebody will come along in a loving way, and they'll go, well, that's not pronounced that way. Well, you know, yeah, I'm pretty sure I know how to read. You know, and this says job. No, no, no. There's no silent E, but his name is pronounced as though it was a silent E, and so it's Job. So if you didn't know that, I just, I just initiated you, okay? So you, you're, you're part of that. It's, it's Job. Now, Job is, uh, was the wealthiest guy of his day, very influential, had a lot going on. I mean, he, he was... He was, uh, had a lot of business going on. He, he, he had a lot of livestock. He had a lot of land. I mean, he was very, very influential. He had a good-sized family. He had seven boys and three girls, and, and uh, he was married. And So anyways, Job has this massive, massive setback. He loses on nearly everything that I just described. I mean, in this freak set of events that happened, uh, people that, invaders came in, stole a lot of his, his assets, his, his camels, his donkey, sheep, all those, and, and then a number of other events happened where he lost all of his wealth, lost all of his influence, and then his kids were all kind of celebrating this party together, they were all in, in, under one roof, and a freak storm came. And collapsed on his kids, and they were all killed. Terrible, terrible tragedy. And then right around that time, he comes down with this horrible illness that's extraordinarily painful and could possibly kill him. So, I mean, he is in the setback of setbacks. Now, the setbacks we have is, you know, it's a loss of pro progress, defeat, a plan, loss of good fortune. Job, obviously was in that. And here's what he says. I looked for good to come, but evil came instead. I waited for some light, but darkness fell instead. The churning inside of me never stops. Maybe some of you feel that way. You know, the churning, the, the you, your stomach's upset. You can't sleep. It just, it, 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 in your, in your body, it's just, it's, there's anxiety, all that. The churning inside me never stops. Waves of misery crass over me. Well, this is, this is Job's plight. And he is in this massive setback. Now, the good news is, going to the end of the book, 
I'm going to ruin it for you if you haven't read it. It's still a great book. If you're in a setback, you need to read Job. But it, by the end of the book, he is, gets everything back. He's like restored all the things that he lost in this incredible comeback. He gets it all back. But how does he do that? Well, that's what we're going to look at. If you're in a setback place in your life, if you're in a difficult place, you want to do what Job did in his life. Now, you might be saying, Andy, I'm not in that place. I'm, things are going good for me. Well, if that's you, I'm glad for you. That's great. Awesome. But you'll want to take notes because life is a series of mountains and valleys. And it's only a matter of time until... You go through a setback, because we all do. Storms come into all of our lives at some point, and they, you can get stuck there if you're not careful, and so you want to definitely follow what Job did. Now, Job, he learned to trust God through all of it. We're going to talk about what that looks like now. It might not look what you think it, it would be like, but he trusted God through his setback, trusting God for a great comeback, and he's commended for that in, in the Bible. Towards the end, he's commended. God commends him for that. And so we're going to use that trust uh, as, a, as a, what do you do when you're, when, when, when you're in that kind of situation? Well, we're going to use trust as an acronym and use those five, five points we see that happens in, in Job's life. First thing, you need to tell God, you know, what, what, what you're feeling. I mean, you need to be honest. You need to be uh, you need to be open with them. Tell them exactly how you feel because it's an important part of our interchange with God that we're honest with him. See, the problem is sometimes when we're in pain, when we have a setback, we, when we're talking to God, we tell him if we talk to God, right? So sometimes we just, hey, I don't even want to talk to you. But when we talk to God, we tell him what we think he wants us to say. What, he, what, what a, a Christ, good Christian should say, what we ought to say. But that is not what God wants. He wants you to be honest and what you're really feeling. Hey, God, I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I, I, I have doubts. I have fear going on. I mean, just whatever's going on in your life, you're being honest. And when we're honest to God and, and when we communicate, when we pray to Him, that's a form of worship. Now, if you're not honest... If you're just making stuff up, you're saying what you think you should say or what you think he wants you to say, that, that's just pretentiousness. And God's not interested in that at all. You get, nothing happens good there. And so Job does that. Job stood up, tore his robe in grief. That's what they did in the Middle East. That was kind of a, a, a vulnerable way of talking about their feelings or showing their feelings. Shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and he worshiped. In other words, he focuses on God. When you're in a difficult place, you know, focusing on God, this is what it means to worship. And coming to God and being honest, and certainly Job is that, he says, I can't be quiet. And he just says, I'm flat out angry. I'm angry. I have to speak. And if you look at Job, the book of Job, through the, as, as it progresses, you see him in shock. You see him confused. You see him struggling with doubts. You see him struggling with... Um, with, with, with all kinds of things going on in his life. You know, he complains to God. I mean, he just, he starts pouring his heart out, and one, which is one of the reasons Job has been such a rich source over the centuries to people who are in pain, who are in a setback. They read Job, and they feel like Job's talking for them, just like many of the Psalms. Now, we see this in other uh, characters in the Bible, other prophets. For example, Jeremiah had a huge setback in his life. And so he goes he, and he writes a book about some of his setbacks. It's called Lamentations, which means, you know, he's complaining, he's crying out, he's sad, it's, he's lamenting. And it's on Lamentations. He says, Cry out in the night, pour out your heart like water in prayer to the Lord. You know, just that, that's the kind of prayer that you just kind of like water, you know, spills out. You know, if you've heard, we use that term, just, you know, spill your guts out. That's kind of what he's saying. You know, when you go to God in prayer, you're in a setback, you're in a difficult place, you're struggling with loss, you're having all of these emotions, these turmoil things going on in your life, spill it out. Let it pour out like water. And then he goes on and he says this, he goes, you know, I feel like he's talking to God. He goes, I feel like you've lied to me, God. You've deceived me. That's, that's 
you were to have a little grid, what, what should I say? You might not say that. But he's saying what's on his heart. Now listen, God can handle your emotions. He gave you the emotions you have. God's got emotions. And he says we're made in his image. It's one of the things that separated us from the animal kingdom. Is that we have emotions. We can express them. We can share them. Those feelings. And we and you just are open with God about it. And he can handle it. There's no emotion that he goes, oh no, I can't see that. No, that's too much. No, it's part of the way we process that. You know, with uh, in the book of Ruth, there's a gal named Naomi. She lost her husband. She lost her two sons, her only kids that she had. She was in a lot of pain. Here's what she says. She says, call me bitter because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. She goes, you know, I might as well just change my name because I'm, I'm a mess. I'm not in a good place at all. David says this. He says, I'm hurting, Lord. Will you forget me forever? How much longer, Lord? Will you look the other way when I'm in need? How much longer must I cling to this constant grief? I endure shaking of my soul. I endure the shaking of my soul. Some of you can relate to that. You're in this constant place of grief. You had a loss. You had a setback. You had, you, you, you know, your dream died. Something, you know, has put you in a place where, you know, maybe you're struggling with, you know, loneliness. All kinds of things go into our lives, and we're just shaken to the very depth of our being. You know what's interesting about David? He's, here he is just sharing. He's super vulnerable, right, sharing his feelings. God says of David, he goes, oh, he's a man after my own heart. That's what he says about it when we share from our heart and we're, when we're open Another place he says this, I believed, so I said, I am completely ruined. I mean, I like that because it's almost like a contrast. He goes, I have faith, I believe, but I also feel ruined. I'm in this terrible place. In other words, he's complaining to God. And he goes, I believe in you, God, but I'm not feeling it right now. You know, I mean, he's complaining to God. An atheist, who who does he complain to or she? To themselves, I guess, right? This is their way of saying, no, I, I still believe, but it's not feeling too good right now. I feel ruined. I'm in a difficult place, but he's sharing. So the first thing is tell God, you know, exactly how you feel. Second thing is refuse to become bitter because when we allow at first, you know, those emotions, the anger and the, all of the, you know, the, the sadness the hurt, the sorrow, all those things, those, we want to share those so that they don't become embittered feelings. If they stay there and they fester and they rot in our soul, it becomes bitterness. And bitterness hurts us always more than anybody else. Always. Sometimes people are bitter at somebody else because of what they've done, how they hurt them, how they victimize them. And then they're resentful and bitter thinking they're hurting the other person it only hurts you that other person might be going on with their on their merry way doing whatever they want not thinking anything of what they did to you and so we need to let make sure that bitterness doesn't get us that we and and the way job does that is, is he gets the bigger perspective than just his own his where he's at he goes i came naked and from my mother's womb and i shall have nothing when i die I just want to pause right there. I, I'm a father of three children, and all, they were all boys. And I can attest, I was there when they came out of Sharon's womb, and they had nothing. They didn't have any toys. They didn't have, like, a portfolio and a satchel or anything. They were, they were naked. And when, and when they leave, that's the way they'll be. I've done hundreds of funerals over the, over the decades, and I've never seen a hearse pull up with a U-Haul. Hey, he's taking it with him. I mean, we come in with nothing. I'm kind of playing around, but it's good to remember because sometimes we get attached to the world around us. He goes, hey, I came in with nothing. I, I'm going to leave with nothing. He goes, the Lord gave me everything I had, and they were his to take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He goes, he's not, you know, he didn't sin by falling into that. He goes, hey, I recognize God's the one who brought this into into my life and so it's not letting bitterness get a hold of us now here's job's question 
Will I love God and trust God regardless of what happens to my life? Or is it conditional? There's a lot of people, their faith is conditional. You know, there's a lot of fair-weather Jesus followers. Things are going good. Sign me up. I want that. But listen, faith is only real faith if it's tested. And faith gets tested through hardship. What are you going to do? You know, how are you going to react? And so Job certainly was tested, and we are tested. Will I love God? Will I trust God regardless of what happens? This is what Job's saying. Hey, it was God's to give. It's God's to take away. It's God's. My job is to trust him that he knows what's best. How do, do you trust God when you're a mess, when your heart's breaking? When, how do you see God when your eyes are filled with tears? I mean, it's a challenge, right? Well, a lot of it has to do with what we bring as far as our attitude. You know, recognizing God is the one who gives. God is abundant. He cares for me, and he will continue to do that. The antidote to bitterness is gratitude for God's goodness. Remind, reminding yourself, you know, God is good. Now, life is not always good. Somebody told, you know, some, I know there's a phrase that a lot, some people like to use a lot. Life is good. Well, what about when life isn't good? It's not always good. You, I guess you stopped saying that phrase for a while, right? Life's not good. Oh, well, a few weeks ago, life was good. Well, it's not today. You know, so, no, it's, it's gratitude for what God, His goodness, regardless of what life is bringing me today. We talk about this in Growth Track, about how God loves you. He's got a plan, an assignment for you, regardless of what the circumstances today look like. He's not giving up on you. And so today is step three, right after this service. You can go in there. We have a nice lunch, actually, for you. Uh, we have uh, kids. We'll watch your kids. I mean, we want to, and it's only an hour, and we want to talk to you about how much God loves you. Here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and this is what Job had to remember when he was in a difficult space. This is, the, this is what we talk about on Growth Track. And step three, we'll be talking about this. God will never stop loving me. Job remembered that. Now it's important. God has a plan for my life. God cares about every detail of my life. God is in control of things I don't understand. God will protect me. Easier said than done because when you're in a difficult place, it doesn't feel like you're getting protected. But God will. He will protect you. He will provide for you. He's going to watch over you. He's going he's to provide a comeback. When you just look at a slice, then it's not enough. You can end up falling in off a cliff. What if you were to just to show up and see when Jesus was being crucified? You'd say, I don't see any protection going on there. I don't see any love, not feeling the love. See, it's one little slice of the suffering of Christ, but when you take the bigger picture and you see the redemptive work of God through that whole process, and that's what Job did as he stepped back, he looked, he goes, you know what, God's bigger than what I can see, and he reminded himself of that. You know, Habakkuk, another guy in the, kind of a crazy name, right? Some interesting names in the Old Testament. Habakkuk, he's a prophet in the, in the Old Testament, some, he's at a setback. In fact, his whole country, all his countrymen, his country is in a setback. They're in a difficult place. He looks around, he surveys that, and uh, it's only three chapters. If you're in a setback and you only want to read three chapters and not 30 like Job has, Habakkuk's the place to go. And there Habakkuk says, why? Why is this happening? Isn't that the question? When we're in a difficult place, the first thing is why? What did I do to deserve this? What's going on? And so at the end of the book, chapter 3, he says this, Even though the fig trees have no fruit and no grapes grow on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no grain, he's describing a pretty dismal situation. Even though the sheep all die and the cattle stalls are empty, he's describing his situation. This isn't theoretical. He's going, it's wiped out. It doesn't look good at all. He says, I'll still be joyful and glad. Because the Lord God is my Savior. He recognizes God's my provision. He's the one who's going to get me through this. He's going to help me. How do you resist bitterness? Well, if you want to resist bitterness, you've got to re just realize that we live in an imperfect world where these kinds of things happen to us. Nobody's picking on us. There's plenty of disappointment to go around. But also, 
Bitterness and happiness are our choice. We get to choose that. We, that's one of the values of, of Vineyard. We say we want to choose joy because every day you have to make that decision. I'm going to choose joy because I can choose other, other things, but I'm not going to fall into that. Okay, the third thing. So we talked about telling God exactly how you feel. Don't fall into bitterness. Then unite with people who will help me focus on God. That's the church today. I mean, we need people that are going to encourage us, lift us up, support us. And it's a powerful thing when the church comes together and meets because we grow from that. When we're going through pain, suffering, sorrow, sadness, and loss, our natural reaction is not, oh, I need to be around people. It's the opposite, to withdraw, to just go into our own selves, particularly when, it's, when we're in a lot of pain. And that's the time we need to press in. That's the time we need to say, you know what, I need people more than ever. And so that certainly is my hope that for those of you who are new to our church, maybe this is your first time and you are in a place of setback. You're in a difficult place. You're in a place of loss or something's happened in your life where you're struggling with loneliness. I invite you here to Vineyard Church. You're welcome here. We want you here and we want to stand with you through your whatever challenge you're going through. And certainly if you're, you've been in this church for a while, you know that's, that's a big part of what we do. We want to stand with you. It says, don't let, now this is Elihu, the friend of Job's. He's there, he's a friend. Job's not alone, and, and his friend, a wise a dude who knows quite a bit, in fact, God uh, commends him later on. He says, don't let your anger and the pain you endured make you sneer at God. Reputation and riches cannot protect you from distress. We'll come back to that in just a second. Nor can you find safety in the dark world below. He's talking about the occult. Don't turn to evil as a way of escape. God's power is unlimited. Now notice he says, others have praised God for what he has done, so join with them. He's talking about the power of coming together with other people that have the shared value of, of, putting, of letting God work in their life. God's at work. He loves us. He, and we encourage one another. There is something powerful when we come together in person. I know we're doing remote church. We've done remote church for years. Of course, there's a lot more going on because of COVID. Some people just can't come. That's the minority. More, a lot of people just don't want to come. But l- uh, let me just say uh, that there's a dozen plus benefits you get by coming to an in-person service that you don't get remotely. You don't get it remotely. So it's all there is to it. Is remote better than nothing? It is. But is remote equal to in-person services? It is not. There's, God is at work in unique ways, and you get benefits of a lot of things, particularly when you're going through a difficult situation that you will not get remotely. How do we connect in with other people? Well, you're going to find people that can encourage you, stand with you in weekend services. This is one of them. We have three weekend services currently. We'll probably add a fourth, honestly, because, you know, it's, the percentages are different now, right? We, we, don't, we don't want people packed in together. But currently, we still have three. And we come together, we worship, we pray, we read God's word together, we challenge one another, we encourage one another. But ultimately, a lot of that happens in a small group. We have some online small groups, but we, most of our small groups are happening you know, some at home, but mostly right here in the church. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, not too late to be part of one. Our semester just started. You can find out more about our small groups at the information desk as you leave. It's right there on your right. Or you can go on to vineyardchurch.com, come and be part of one of our small groups, particularly if you're in a difficult place. But that's, that's where you find the encouragement, the power Reputation, I said I'd go back to that. This is the same verse earlier on. Reputation and riches cannot protect you from distress. In other words, pain comes to all of us. And there's nothing that really protects you. You can't be, it's impartial, but it's also, you know, your, pain, your, you know, your possessions, your money. That stuff really doesn't change anything. When you're in pain, when you're estranged from your child or You've lost a parent or somebody's sick in your, I mean, these things don't help. We're all in that spot. He says, 
that it's, that it's impartial in that way. Don't, and then he says, don't turn to evil as a way to escape. You know, there's plenty of people as their way of escape, they do destructive things. They, they get drunk. They start loading up on the meds way beyond what the doctor says to do. You know, they're just, they're ODing really. Or they, or they do illegal drugs. Or they cut. Or they have an affair. Or there's all kinds of things that we can do to, as a way of escape that's destructive and hurtful to us and others. He's giving the advice. He's saying, you know, I'm, he, it's understandable you're in pain, but don't go that direction. He says, others have praised. Go in the other direction. That's the time to press in to the people of God, people that will encourage you. I love this verse. He says, go to the Lord for help and worship him. In other words, focus on God. That's the time when you're in a difficult place. And, here, and God says when you do that, he'll give you wisdom and power. Real power belongs to God. From him we learn how to live and also what to live for. So how to live, what to live for. What, how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to need two things for sure. You're going to need wisdom. What's, what's my next step? What's my next play? And you're going to need strength to do it, to follow through with that. Look at this verse. Those who worship God will be encouraged you know when we go to church studies show this out you can look at you can google it studies show that when you go to church regularly that you have that most people have lower blood pressure that their heart rate is lower that they're more at peace they live longer that's a good deal i like that it's good for you physiologically certainly psychologically and absolutely spiritually all of those things Here's what Paul said. He said, you know, he's, he was in a small group. So he's talking to a small group. He said, you guys, you've been praying for me. He says, because you are praying for me and the spirit of Jesus is helping me, he goes, I know this trouble that he's going through. He's in a setback at this place, time in his life. He goes, I know this trouble will bring my freedom. He's actually in prison. He's got a number of things that he's been struggling with. And he goes, you know, I know because you have been praying for me, God's going to set me free. I'm going to have a great comeback. And I want to let you know that as a church family, we stand together. You know, the Bible says when one suffers, they all suffer within the body of Christ. We want to stand with you if you are in a difficult place in your life. Because some of you are there. Some of you, you know, you're maybe of no fault of your own. But you find yourself you know, in a, in, a, in a place, an emotional hole, maybe you're struggling with loneliness, maybe you have a, a, a conflict, a huge conflict in your life, and, you, and it just looks like it's getting bigger, and you're struggling with all kinds of things. Maybe you have a loss, maybe you have a financial loss, maybe a relational loss, a, a loss of a loved one, maybe a business, a, all kinds of things that can happen. And you are in that place. And I want to say, I, we care for you. We want to support you. We want to do what Paul was talking about. We want to pray for you. And so I want to do that right now. On behalf of the Vineyard Church family, I want to pray for you. So if you would bow your heads. If you'd bow your heads. And if that is you, you're saying, you know, I am in a difficult place. I'm going to ask you to do something that's very bold. Maybe outside your comfort zone. I'm not going to make you talk or anything. But I am going to ask you if you're in a place where you're saying, I am in pain. I'm in a setback. I'm in a place of loss. I'm in a season that is, is really, really uncomfortable. I need some kind of breakthrough. Then I'm going to ask you if you would just to stand just where you're at. If that's you. If it's not, feel free to stay seated. But if that's you, I'm going to ask you to stand. Okay, I've several people actually stand. It's not too late to stand up. That's it. I'm just going to ask you to stand. No, nothing else. No talking. No running up forward. Just saying, you know what? I need that. Sharon and I did this about a year ago at a conference we were at. Somebody asked us to stand for something. We stood and I'm, I want to let you know people all over prayed for us and everyone who's standing. I want to let you know things started to change for the thing we were standing on. I didn't even make the connection. It was my daughter-in-law later came up because she was there. She said, you know, things started changing right after you and Sharon stood up and received prayer. God does things. It means something. 
it's not insignificant. When we stand up and we say, I need prayer from people around me, just like Paul said, there's nothing to be embarrassed of. It's our honor as brothers and sisters with you to pray for you. Anybody else? Some more people stood. Okay. Stay standing, please. Stay standing. I'm going to ask now, for those of you who are not standing, if you're near them, we're not going to do anything, you know, because of COVID, like laying hands, but I want you to extend your maybe your hand out towards them because I'm praying on behalf of all of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I lift up everyone who is standing right now. I'm sorry for the pain they're in, the difficulty they're struggling with. Lord, we know you have the power to change things, and so as brothers and sisters on their behalf, we come before you and say, Lord, give them a breakthrough. Give them this comeback that we know you can do. Lord, I pray that you pour into their heart wisdom. That you pour into their heart strength. That you inject hope into their life. Those of you who are struggling with insomnia, Lord, I just pray rest upon your soul, upon your mind, that you would not have any more insomnia that God's peace would settle upon your life, upon your bed, in your room. Lord, we just pray, do this now, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the honor to be able to pray for those who have stood up and said, man, I, could, I need God's divine intervention right now. Lord, we want to stand with them. We anticipate that you're going to do something and do it soon, and we pray this in Jesus' name. You can remain, you, you can be seated. We love you. You don't, you don't go through this alone. It's, you were never meant to go through this kind of stuff alone. We do it and we do it together because there's power when we're in it together. Then surrender. Surrender my future to God. You know, when we go through difficulty, the thing that sidelines us is not the grief. Grief is actually a good thing. It's part of the way that we process our feelings. It's the fear that comes with what if this thing gets worse? What if this thing unwinds? What if God never comes through? I mean, it's the fear of the future that will really sideline us. And so that's where we surrender. Jesus calls us to follow him. You know, he went around during his earthly ministry and he was always saying, follow me, come, come follow me, walk with me. And that's what he says today. Just follow him, and that's what we call surrender. You know, because there's a when, when we decide to start to put God first in our lives, there becomes this struggle, my will and then God's will. Which one will I do? And it's just kind of this wrestling match. And some people wrestle their whole life. That's called a carnal Christian, by the way. Somebody who's always wrestling, they never get that resolved. And so what, what God invites us to do is surrender. Now, we get advice from people when we're in a difficult place. Some, and, you know, actually, honestly, a lot of advice we get is not biblically based. It's not godly advice. It, it can be people that, ha that think they have your best intention. There are people you've known for years, some friends. It could be even family members that you love you, but they give you just bad advice. That happened to Job. Job's wife did not die. She was left to be with him, kind of, and she wasn't really supportive at all. Job's wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Why didn't you just curse God and die? Just end it. That's not good advice. It's interesting, you know, Job's the oldest book written in the Bible that we know of. And so it's, this is the earliest encounter of somebody encouraging suicide in literature. Somebody saying, you know, just end it all. Bad advice, bad advice. Job replies, though. You talk like a godless woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. In other words, he says, hey, listen, God's bigger than me. I don't get it all, but I am going to surrender my plan to his. It's not all about filtering what I think God should do according to my wisdom, because my wisdom's not big enough. So he says, even if God takes my life, I still will trust him. That's what he's doing. He's trusting him through that. That's a famous verse. A lot of people know it as, though he slay me, 
You know, no matter what happens, man, I'm going down trusting God. I will not change on that. The question, how do you know if your faith is weak or mature? Because as I said, any real faith is tested. So how do you know if you have weak faith? Well, your, your, your daily life looks like this. That's what you look like. Just worried all the time. You know, and, and frankly, Jesus had a lot to say about worry. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, people who don't know God, they're just always worried. That's, you, you, say, you might say, oh, I believe in God, but when we worry, we're, we're, we're basically saying we, we don't. He won't provide. He, everything's uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen. And we worry, and we worry, and we worry. Lastly, trust Jesus for every detail of my comeback. The comeback's going to come. But I trust Jesus with all of those details. Here's what Jesus said. He said, by trusting me, so who do we trust? He says, Jesus, we follow him. We trust him. By trusting me, you will be unshakable and, and assured. What do you need when you're in a setback, when you're in a difficult place, when you're in a storm? You need to be unshakable. You need to be assured, not in yourself, but in, in your relationship with Christ, deeply at peace. In this world, you will continue to experience difficulties, but take heart. Jesus says, I've conquered the world. That's the promise we anchor ourselves to. That's what gives us peace, real peace, unshakable, assured. Now, in the New Testament, there is a, uh, one of the New Testament writers talks about Job. He says, hey, you know what? Job actually can teach us a lot. He says this, take the old prophets as your mentors. Job was one of those. He says, they put up with anything, went through everything, and never once quit all the time honoring God. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. You see, when you're in a tough spot, we think, I might as well just throw in the towel. Give up on this marriage. Give up on this relationship. Give up on this person. He goes, no, no, you stay the course. You've heard, of course, of Job's staying power. That's the lesson of Job, by the way, his staying power. And you know how God brought it all together from him for him at the end that's because God cares right down to the last detail so every detail you give to God of your comeback every detail now Job is a great encouragement because Job ended up getting at the end twice what he lost it's incredible because he's already the wealthiest guy around had all of this blessing in his life but he says after Job prayed for his friends because he had some friends that were giving bad advice too. The Lord gave him success again. In fact, the Lord gave Job twice as much as everything as he had had been blessed with before. Now God wants to pour a blessing out. And in fact, I believe it's double. That's, it's not just Job. It's double. When we're faithful, when we trust him, watch for not just a comeback, a great comeback. God breaks into our lives in a great way. Let's bow our heads. We'll pray. If you would, just bow your heads, close your eyes. This is a, a holy moment, really, as God works in and among us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you come, give people the courage to step out and trust you people that are in tough place, people that are far from you. Maybe you know that's you. Maybe you're saying, you know, I need, I need Jesus. I need that staying power. I need the peace that I know only God can give me. I've tried medication. I've tried different things. Ultimately, I know that there's oh, emptiness that only God can fill. And that's true. That's a blessing to even recognize your need. Say, God, I need you. So I'm going to invite you. If that's you, you're saying, I need God right now, then I'm not going to have you stand up like I did just a few minutes ago or come forward. It's not about joining the church, joining this church. It's about saying, I want to follow. I want to be a follower of Christ. Today is my day. Say, God, I need your Holy Spirit to fill me up, to give me that 
staying power, the peace, the endurance, the joy. And that's all available to you. But your next step, your first step, is to put your faith in Christ. To say, yes, I want to follow Christ. And for some of you, that's what you need to do right now. And I'm going to invite you just right where you're at, just to pray with me and to invite Christ into your life. To say yes to God. Right where you're at. Now, I'm going to invite you to let God know about your decision. And let me know as well. So with all heads still bowed, I'm going to ask you boldly, so I know who to be praying for, I'm going to ask you to just lift your hand up and say, I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to follow him. Bless you. See, that's me. Yep, I see you right there. Halfway back in the back. People actually all over the auditorium. Yeah, come on. Keep your hand up. Keep your arm up. Put it up high. Some of you, you still need to say, this is my moment right now. Would you do that? There you go. Say yes today. Okay, put your hands down. I want to pray. Just follow me. Say, dear God, today, I want to follow you. I want to surrender my will for your will. Would you say, God, I invite your power into my life, your presence, your peace. And through your power, I can walk free. You say, God, today I want to take the next step by saying yes to you, confessing my sin. Just say, God, today I want to confess and say, I'm, I'm sorry that I've, I'm a sinner. I've done things my own way. And I need a new, fresh start with your help. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, a lot of people just prayed with me right there. Would you Join me and congratulate them and just say, you know what, we're proud of you. As a church family, we, we want to support you. And I want to invite you to find a church that you can belong to, that, that believes in, in, in the gospel and believes in the Bible. You're welcome here. There's other churches, though. We don't think everybody's supposed to be here, but we invite you to find a church. And, and, and if this is the church you're saying, hey, I'd like to start here, then your next step is growth track. And again, step three, you can, you can join. You don't have to start at step one. You can come in, you know, uh, today right after this service. We'd love to have you in there. And, uh, and I, in fact, I hope, I hope you are. I hope you do get in there. Let us know about your decision if you decided to follow Christ. Here's the way you can do that. Just text 704-5504 and just type in know God. That way I can pray for you by name. And that way, uh, not only can I pray for you by name, but I can help you with your next step. I, we want to join with you in your journey. We're not going to show up at your house or anything like that. We just, we're, we're all about this. We're serious about it. If you have any prayer requests, let us know. You can type in pray. Of course, you can put that as well on the connect card that's in your program. Put it on the clear box as your way out. Also, ways to give. Uh, there's text 45777 probably is the easiest. Uh, and we believe that when we give, it's an act of worship. It's one of the ways we express our love to God. And uh, so it's an honor and it's a privilege. If you're new with us, don't feel pressured to give. We're just glad that you're here and that you got to hear what God has for you and gave us the opportunity to pray for you. Okay, would you stand with us? We're going to close in this last song as we go to God and, and just sing one more time and declare his goodness. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, I pray, Father, for an outpouring of your spirit in our community, in this church. Lord, I pray for comebacks that are uh, beyond what we can even ask, imagine, or dream for. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.